Hello and Merry Christmas to all of you. I hope that all of you are having a wonderful Christmas. In our Christmas Sunday School lesson, we're going to, yes, see and learn about the birth of Christ. Yet at the same time, we are going to see that the Lord is one that keeps his promises. As we know, there are many requirements. There were many prophecies that have been set in place for one to be able to claim to be the Messiah, Christ. We will see here in our lesson this week that God fulfilled each prophecy. He fulfilled each promise that led to the birth of the Messiah. Okay, so our lesson opens with scripture telling us about a decree that was sent out by Caesar Augustus, the first Roman emperor who reigned from 27 BC to 14 AD. Caesar, his decree was that there was to be a registration or a census in all the world. Now, when we see all the world there in scripture, we should note that this is speaking about all the land of the Roman Empire. The land of Judea was a province of Rome. So everyone that was living in the land of Judea, we are told they had to return. They had to return to their own city to take part in this census. So Joseph and Mary, they went up from Nazareth, again, a city of Galilee, to their own city. We are, again, as we saw in our Sunday School lesson last week, we are told that Joseph was of the house in the lineage of David. And because he was of the house of David, Joseph, he went up to the city of David, which is known as Bethlehem. However, what is often overlooked in scripture is that Joseph was not the only one of Jesus' parents that was of the house of David. Jesus could certainly lay claim to the throne and to being the Messiah because of Mary's marriage to Joseph. However, Joseph had absolutely nothing to do with the conception of Christ. As we saw last week, the conception of Christ was through the work of the Holy Spirit, which again led to Christ being conceived in the womb of Mary. Mary, scripture shows us, was also of the house and the lineage of David. Her lineage can be seen there in the third chapter of Luke's gospel. Now you will notice a drastic difference in the genealogy of Jesus in this chapter compared to the one found in the first chapter of Matthew's gospel. The reason being because the genealogy of Jesus as it is shown in the first chapter of Matthew's gospel is being traced through Joseph. Mary's lineage traces back to David through her father, She's named Heli. Now, as you work your way through her tree, there are a lot of names there that we don't necessarily recognize. Her tree does not have that name recognition, that name power as Joseph's tree, which is filled with well-known kings, kings like Solomon, kings like Uzziah, kings like Hezekiah. However, what we will notice is that her tree has a name in there that we may not recognize, but it is a key name, the name being Nathan. So who was Nathan? Well, to find out who Nathan was, we'll turn over and we'll look at the third chapter of First Chronicles, and we'll look at the first through the ninth verse there. And in that passage of scripture, we'll see the family of David is listed out for us. We'll see the six children that were born in Hebron while David reigned there. Then, as we continue reading through that passage of scripture, we'll see those children that were born while David reigned in Jerusalem. Nathan, we will see there in the fifth verse, was one of those that were born while David reigned in Jerusalem. Now, if we pay close attention to this verse, we will see that Nathan was born through Bathsheba. Yes, that Bathsheba, the Bathsheba that David committed adultery with and then sent her husband on the front lines in battle to try and hide and cover up his sins. Nathan, Nathan was technically speaking their fourth child since the first child they had was lost due to again David's sin. So either through Joseph or through Mary, Jesus could say that he came through the lineage of David. Jesus could say that he was a house of David, though Joseph's lineage, because he was a man, would have been the one that was most recognized at that time. That is why we see in the third chapter of Luke's gospel, that is why we see his name mentioned rather than Mary's name mentioned. So as we will see here, while they were there in Bethlehem, Bethlehem was very crowded because of this registration, because of this census. We're told that there was no room in the inn. We're told that Mary, 
ended up going into labor. And we're told that Mary ended up giving birth. She gave birth in a barn because again, there was no room in the inn. So Jesus had a very lowly birth. And Jesus laid in a manger. He laid in an eating trough that was used for horses. And then he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. Jesus was born in a very small city of Bethlehem, which again, fulfilled another prophecy about the birth of Christ. Found in the fifth chapter of Micah, and there in the second verse, we'll see the prophecy about the Messiah being born in Bethlehem. It is stated there in that prophecy that Bethlehem, though it was little among Judah, yet out of it, out of Bethlehem, would come forth to God the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth were from old and from everlasting. You see, Jesus came from old. Jesus came from everlasting. He came from eternity down to our world. As stated in John's gospel, in the first chapter, John stated in his gospel that the word was there in the beginning with God and that the word was God. The word was Jesus. The word, John said, became flesh and it dwelt among the people. Many people received the word. Many people received God in the flesh. Yet there were a great many more, as we know, that rejected God in the flesh. They rejected the word of God in the flesh, in Jesus Christ. With God being in the world, you would think, you would think that it should have been a moment of great joy. Yet again, as we know, there were many people that rejected the word of God in the flesh. It should have been a moment again of great joy that the Savior was born, just as we'll see here in the next part of our lesson today. So in the next part of our lesson here, we'll see the scene shift for us here in the first chapter of Luke's gospel. The scene, it shifts for us to a field where shepherds were, we are told, living out in the fields. They were keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, this is actually a hint for us that Jesus was not born in the winter. He was not born in a cold season. This is a thought that I actually went over in a recent Bible study. And if you're interested, you can go to that Bible study. You can read it. The link for that Bible study is in the description below. It is a study about the birth of Christ, where I go deeper into scripture about the birth of Christ. Now, here in our lesson, we are told that as they were out in the field, the shepherds, they were visited by an angel that brought to them, we are told, good tidings. Good tidings meaning good news. He brought good news of great joy that was not for some people, not for just a select few people, but was for all people. What was that good news? The good news was that God loved the world and that God gave his only begotten son. The good news was that the Savior, Christ, had been born in the city of David. The Savior, Christ, had been born in Bethlehem. Because the Lord knows how our minds work, he even gives the shepherds there more specific information as to where they could go and find the Messiah resting. The angel tells them that they can find the Savior lying in a manger so that they can go and prove it for themselves. They could have proof of the sign that the Messiah, that Christ had been born. In the next two verses, we are told that suddenly, there were more angels that appeared with the one. And all the angels, they began to worship. They began to sing praises to the Lord. The angels, the angels were rejoicing at the birth of Christ. Now, what were they rejoicing about? Why were they rejoicing? The angels were rejoicing because they knew the desire of the Lord. They knew why the son was given to the world. You see, the son was given to save mankind. The son was given to the world to save mankind from the guilty punishment of sin, which leads to not just a physical death, but leads to a spiritual death. As we take a look here at the first chapter of Genesis, we can see that the Lord has always desired to dwell with mankind. When God created mankind, we see the Godhead there. That is the Father, that is the Son, that is the Holy Spirit. We see the Godhead saying there, let us, 
make man in our image. Let us make man in our likeness. Now, we often think of this verse from a physical standpoint, but I like to think of this verse from a spiritual standpoint. What I mean by this is that God, we should understand, is perfect. He is without sin. He is benevolent. God, when he created mankind, he did not create us as sinful creatures. You see, God did not create us as sinful creatures because God is incapable of doing such. Because again, he does not know sin. In fact, there was no sin in his creation at all. We're told in the last verse of the first chapter of Genesis, when God saw everything that he had made, scripture tells us plainly that it was not just good, it was very good. God created his creation, God created man to be perfect. God created man in his image, in his likeness, so that man would be just like him, so that man would be righteous, so that man would have glory. And we did, for a point in time, man was righteous. Man had a shine of glory about it. This was true up until mankind sinned in the garden. When we sinned in the garden, we lost our glory. We became polluted. We became corrupted in our hearts. We became sin. Sin is the very thing that the Lord will not dwell with. So God gave the world his only begotten son. And he gave the world his only begotten son to restore mankind back to its righteousness, back to the glory it once had. Through faith in his only begotten son, the Lord would be able to dwell with a righteous creation, just as he always desired. This is why the angels rejoiced. So here's a question for you. If the angels were rejoicing and they were praising and they were worshiping the birth of the Savior, why don't we? Are we saying that we are too good to rejoice at the birth of our Savior? Now, some will say, well, it's because Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. They will say that that was not the day that he was born, so I have nothing to rejoice about. Others will say that they can't believe, but they would believe if only they could have seen him with their own eyes. My response to this is, well, that's just another excuse and another excuse. Let us remember. There were many that literally saw Jesus. They saw God in the flesh, and yet they still rejected him. Faith it is not about what we can see with our own eyes. Faith, it is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. So the truth of the matter is it boils down to faith. Do you believe that this is true? Do you believe it? Can you accept it? Our lesson, it closes out with the shepherds. It closes out with them saying, let us now go to Bethlehem. Let us see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. I want you to understand today that God has made known to us the birth of his only begotten son. And you see, all of us today, we should be tasting and seeing just as David said, taste and see that the Lord is good. We should be tasting and seeing that the truth is the truth. You see, God has made his truth known to us and we are able to test it. We are able to try it out by trying out the Lord. We, we should be giving his truth a try today and see how good God is to us. And we will find out, just as I found out for myself, you will find out that the Lord truly is exactly what he says he is. God is my everything, and I know that the Lord can be your everything. If you simply believe, if you simply have faith in him and in his only begotten son, you will see how good, you will see how real God actually is. God, you see, I want to conclude today. He has not hidden anything from us. He prophesied and then fulfilled every prophecy with the birth of Christ. Christ was born through the seed of David. Christ was born a virgin's birth. Christ was born in the little city of Bethlehem. 
Again, he fulfilled every prophecy, these three that I have mentioned and more. The only prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled all deal with the end days. And you better believe God is one to keep his promises. He has kept his promises in the past and he's going to keep his promises about the last days. So what have we learned today? What we have learned today is that the birth of Christ, it was a lowly birth. Yet again, God fulfilled his every promise about the birth of Christ. He fulfilled every prophecy about his only begotten son. So therefore, we learn again, God, he keeps his promises. He keeps his promises without fail. We also learn that we should again taste and see that the Lord is good. God has made his word known to us. And so we should again give his word a try. We should digest his word and we should see that the Lord can and will do all that he has promised for us. Through the birth of Christ, we have a savior and we have learned that our savior saves us from sin. And by entering into fellowship with our savior through faith, through true and genuine faith, we learn that we have an everlasting promise, an everlasting home with the Lord, where we will dwell with him for all of eternity. All right, so that is our Sunday school lesson. That is our Christmas Sunday school lesson. That is the last lesson of 2022. Now, if you'd like to go into more depth about this week's Sunday school lesson, there is a link in the description below to where you can read the commentary for this week's lesson and you can listen to a more in-depth audio commentary of our Sunday school lesson for this week. Now, I hope that all of you again have a wonderful Christmas. I hope that all of you will take a moment to share this video with all of those that are around you. Share it online as well. And I hope that all of you will come back for our Sunday school lesson next week, which is the first lesson of 2023. All right. Until that time, I ask all of you to continue to keep everyone around you lifted up in prayer. I will keep all of you lifted up in my prayers and I will pray that the Lord continues to keep and to bless all of you.